afternoon, everybody. This is uh, Tammy King. Thank you, Karen, for the introduction there. And give me just a moment. We grab everything. Very good. All right. And as Karen said, we're here for implementing remote learning recommendations as preschool for all and preschool for all expansion educators. And there we go. Here you get a chance to see what uh, Tammy, uh, what Sandy and I look like, uh, though we won't actually have our cameras on today. Um, there we go. Excellent. All right. And uh, so I happen to be a one of the program managers at Early Childhood Professional Learning. And just to give you a bit of my background, I've been working in the field of English as a Second Language and Bilingual Education since 1999. I was also one of the contributing authors to the ISBE document that we're going to be spending the majority of the next hour taking a deeper look at. I primarily contributed to the early childhood section of that document, but I also gave feedback and reviewed the multilingual section as well. Sandy is one of our coaches in PSS, also at Early Childhood Professional Learning. And in, that, in those two roles, she supports a myriad of different preschool for all and preschool for all expansions uh, educators across the state of Illinois. So I'm thrilled to be able to co-present with her today so that she can share her expertise with you and insights as well. Before today's session, you received an email, and part of that confirmation email was a link to the handout for today. You can see what it looks like up here on the screen. There's no need to print it. I just wanted to show it to you so you know what I'm referencing when I talk about the handout. And you can see here on this handout, there are some blue underlined sections of text. Each one of those uh, blue areas and underlined areas is a hyperlink that will take you directly to that particular document when you click on it. So again, just wanted to let you know that those hyperlinks are there on that document for you. No need to do that during the presentation today, but you can certainly at your leisure take a look at those various links after our one hour presentation today. So in order for us to get to know you a little bit and help us personalize this webinar a little bit towards your learning, if you would kindly click on your role on this poll that's popping up on the screen in front of you right now. All right, so it looks like we have primarily preschool for all teachers is what's coming in at the moment. Um, though we do have a couple of expansion teachers. We have a kindergarten teacher. Thank you for joining us, kindergarten teacher. We've got a few family educators, fantastic. A uh, good number of instructional leaders as well. Uh, a few administrators and some folks who follow who don't fall under any of those categories that we put on the screen, but it looks like you're typing them in the chat. So that's a great practice on knowing how to use that chat box. We've got some coordinators, some IEL staff, program support specialist, of course, hi Sharonda, a speech language pathologist. Um, oh goodness, they're coming in fast and furious here. A speech path, it looks like, infant teacher, family support worker. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Good to see some familiar names on here too. Fantastic. All right, good. So hopefully the information we've pulled together for you today will be useful to you. This is the second time that we have done this webinar. The first time was last week, also to a full house. We did get some positive feedback on that one, so we're confident that this will give you some good, useful information and some resources today, too. The primary focus of today's session is this document. You're looking at uh, four different covers of the document. So the one on the left-hand side, this is the ISBE remote learning document. It is the first set of links on your handout. In fact, any time today that you see this kind of little life preserver up here, this little orange circle that says handout and then a number underneath it, that's indicating what, what you might guess is a certain section on that handout I was showing you earlier. So in this case, handout, 1A, uh, handout and then the first section of that, 1A through D, will give you the links to each of these documents. So it's the remote learning recommendations for remote instruction during the COVID crisis, it is in English and has since been translated into Spanish, Polish, and Arabic, and all of those are able to be accessed by you um, after today's session, if you would like. It was initially, I should mention too, it was initially released on March 27th, and then the uh, translations came shortly after that. Now, in order to give us some background again on where you're at, it would be really helpful for us to know in just a moment when the box pops up for you to rate your knowledge of this particular document. Maybe you signed up for this webinar and that was the first you'd ever heard of it. That's fine. Click that box. Maybe you knew it exists. Somebody told you about it or you saw it on a blog post somewhere, but that's about where it ends. 
or you've skimmed some of it, or maybe you've read certain parts in great detail, or, because some of us have more time than others, <laughs> we've had a chance at this point to read the whole thing from cover to cover. So it looks like we've got the majority of folks are in those first two categories of uh, just becoming familiar with this particular document. So hopefully that's uh, you'll find some really useful information in this and, and that will be highlighting certain sections of the document today. And then we have some folks who've read certain sections of it and even a couple people who've read the whole thing from cover to cover. Cool. I One thing I forgot to mention to you this morning in my haste to unmute myself this morning, goodness, this afternoon, um, I just wanted to let you know that I do have two co-workers upstairs, a five-year-old and a two-year-old, and I am sitting more or less underneath the main hallway of our ranch-style house. It is nap time, so in theory, we shouldn't hear too much of them, but I did just hear them run by. So I will mute my microphone when it's not my turn to talk, but just wanted to let you know that you may or may not hear my uh, <laughs> small children upstairs as we go through this afternoon. All right, with that being said, our agenda is what you're seeing up on the screen. We are planning to do kind of an overview of the ISB document, uh, ISB Remote Learning Recommendations document, take a closer look at certain selected sections from that particular document. Then we're gonna share with you some real examples from Preschool for All and Preschool for All expansion uh, programs from across the state and give you some opportunities to share as well. So, where do you feel you're at right now in your remote learning journey? And when I say remote learning journey here, I'm talking about you teaching your students, not your tech savviness with Adobe Connect that we're on today, but rather you working with your kids. Where would you rate, um, rate yourself at this point? Ah, interesting. So this is coming in somewhat similar to the group that we had last week. A lot of folks saying that they're treading water. Some folks are well, more, more or less equally split between swimming laps and dipping your toe in the water. And a couple of folks who feel like maybe they're drowning at this point. So it is our goal today to not add to your stress level, but rather to give you some helpful resources and some tips and things. Um, and hopefully to reinforce the work that you're already doing. One of the things we noticed after last week's webinar is that a number of people, um, similar to this week, said that they were treading water. But frankly, when we got to some of the sections where they had an opportunity to share, Sandy and I were really impressed with the things that you're doing. So it may just be that you need some positive reinforcement from some colleagues and you may find that you're, you're, you might actually be swimming laps, albeit um, slowly, <laughs> but you might be doing better than, than you're giving yourself credit for, but we'll see. Let's get on with the rest of the information we have for you today. So here is the very beginning of the document. It's got uh, the first three pages. So this is the executive summary. In this section on the very first page, there are some links to some companion documents. They, they are active links, so you can just click right on those. Not right now, not on your screen, but later when you pull this up on your computer, you'll be able to click on those and it'll open right up to those companion documents for you, so that'll be nice. There's also a definition of remote learning and then some essential instructional recommendations and essential grading recommendations as well. Um, one other quick thing I wanted to point out to you here, as we reference page numbers today, we are referencing the little tiny page numbers printed on the actual pages themselves of the document, not the PDF page numbers that show up um, in whatever your PDF reader application is, but rather the page number on the actual sheet itself. So just wanted to let you know that. With regards to that definition of remote learning, the State Board of Ed, when they uh, initially started working uh, with our group, this was back in, oh my goodness, the middle of March, um, the State Board of Ed folks were very clear in giving us the direction before we started writing this document that remote learning meant more than screen time, much more than screen time. So in actually on the very first page of uh, the document, it says that remote learning is learning that happens outside of the traditional classroom because the students and the teacher are separated by distance and or time. It goes on to talk about how the instruction can be real time, in other words, synchronous, or it could be flexibly timed, and it may or may not involve technology. So this is very important as we go through the rest of the day today, you'll see that many of the resources we'll be showing you and things we'll be talking about don't have anything necessarily to do with uh, screen time at all. Then 
on page 17 of the document, uh, you'll see you'll find this chart there. Again, no need to go to it right at the moment, but you can see what it looks like here on the screen and you can go back to it at a later time. But you'll see that there is a chart that has minimum and maximum times listed. Again, this is guidance from the State Board of Ed. And it says that for preschool, we're talking 20 minutes on the minimum end, 60 minutes on the maximum side. But that learning should occur in three to five minute chunks throughout the day. No one is asking preschoolers to be engaged for 60 minutes straight. Um, kindergarten, since we have a kindergarten teacher here, it's 30 and 90 minutes. In your case, again, with three to five minute chunks of time uh, interspersed there. So we want to keep uh, thinking and returning to what we know about de developmentally appropriate practice. To that end as well, you'll see on this particular slide, this actually, this text came from page 35 of the document. And you'll see here that, let me get my arrow for you. That what we are talking about here is that to do this, we are asking that families may be asked to, when possible, spend time with their children, play with their children, share their unique talents and interests, and engage in suggested learning opportunities with their children. And most importantly, let me highlight it for you right here, the emphasis is on, the emphasis from the state in terms of giving guidance is on play-based family learning experiences, not on the mastery of a finite list of skills. And with that, I'm actually going to hand it over to my co-presenter for today, Sandy. And I will mute. Hello, everybody. It's great to be here with all of you. Uh, I'm looking forward to sharing some information with you today because one of my roles today will be to provide examples of how programs are implementing these recommendations. And as Tammy said earlier, I'm currently working with about 14 different districts and community-based organizations that are implementing these recommendations. And so I've been able to both support them as they navigate this new territory, but also to learn from them about what's been working in their programs. Several of them have provided some examples for today um, that you will see within our PowerPoint. Um, recognizing that there are some of you who have been on this journey already for a couple of weeks, um, we're going to give some opportunities today for sharing of some of the things that you've already been doing. Um, and others may be just getting started and may not have as many of their own examples, but our goal today is for you all to learn from one another. Um, so what you see on this slide is an example of the general recommendation that Tammy referred to in the previous slide related to recognizing that family members are key, essential uh, folks for engaging young children in home learning. Uh, we know that no learning can happen um, in this method without other um, adults in the, in the mix who can uh, read through instructions and help children with um, getting activities going. So yes, what you see here is a choice board that was provided for, uh, from the Troy School District in Shorewood, Illinois. And they are distributing these choice boards both electronically and um, at food distribution sites. So as Tammy said earlier, one of the things to keep in mind about this remote learning is that it encompasses more than online examples. Um, we know that not every family has access to reliable internet. So we want to be thinking outside the box, outside that box called the screen. Um, so this particular choice board that you see here is based on the creative curriculum. In fact, it's based on the building study, which you can see at the top of the page. And also at the top, you see that the, the adult who's supporting the preschooler is invited to make a choice of three to four activities. It's not recommended that all of these activities be um, implemented with preschoolers, but maybe just a choice of three to four. 
And the reason why this is such a great um, guidance to families is that then they feel less stressed out and also able to choose from what are the most comfortable activities that they would facilitate at home with their child. What are they comfortable with? What do they have resources for, et cetera? So in a, what I really like about this choice board from Troy is that in addition to choosing a few activities to do throughout the week, they've also recommended some daily to-dos, um, such as just remembering to sing songs with your child and read together and have conversations with children about a question of the day. And as any of you who may be using creative curriculum know that the studies have that embedded question of the day provided, but you can come up with your own question of the day if you're not using creative curriculum. Um, so also this is a good example of best practice as outlined in the recommendations because really the goal here is to encourage families to do what we know is most important, to spend time with their children, to play with their children, and engage with their children together. The last element I'll point out in this example, and we'll talk more about it in a moment, is that there are only a few activities, again, that require technology. This allows families with limited or no access to the internet to still engage in meaningful learning activities with their preschool age child at home. Several of these activities require very little in the way of materials as well, such as under the math category, the suggestion for going on an I spy hunt to just to find excuse me, specifically shaped items around the home. So a simple activity such as that. Um, so now we'd like to give you a moment to share what you've been doing. And so please take a moment to type in the box um, and, um, something that maybe you've been doing to engage families in developmentally appropriate play-based activities. So we're going to give you about mm, 60, 90 seconds to go ahead and type into our box. So we see some monthly calendar ideas, weekly Zoom meetings, scavenger hunts, recording stories of you reading, yep, tip sheets, yep, we'll be talking about the early, early learning project in a few minutes. That's a great resource. And so while we don't expect everybody to be able to read through these while they're being typed, we are going to have Karen, who's our terrific facilitator, um, she will be um, sending out an, a, a copy to everyone of all of the responses so that you'll have this amazing list of different kinds of activities that people are already doing um, in their programs and that you can learn from as well. So we'll go for another moment or two. Thank you, Karen. So one of the things we wanted to be sure, and we kind of plunked this slide a little bit here in the middle of our presentation, because as we're going through our slides, we're, we're thinking that perhaps um, other questions are coming up. And it can be difficult in this format for us to address the kinds of questions that you may be having. So we threw this slide in here to make sure um, that we I'm sorry, I was getting my notes mixed up. Um, so um, uh, we know so we know that the questions are coming up. This website on your screen, COVID19 at isbe.net, is the go-to resource for all your COVID-related questions. Um, the wonderful thing about this uh, is that ISBE has put a system in place whereby these questions are being responded to pretty quickly, um, maybe a day or two. And um, the reason why ISBE is really asking for folks to, um, to um, direct their questions to this particular website is that they're looking for trends, if you will, um, where lots of people may be asking the same questions so that they can produce their information updates and FAQs. Um, so please feel free to use this with any and all of the questions. No question is, is too mundane or 
Um, you know, we all wonder if our questions are good questions. Um, don't don't get caught up in that. Just go ahead and, and forward them on. So now going back into our document, um, I'm going to bring you back to page eight, which is um, where they talk about um, the ultimate aims of this remote learning recommendations document. And this ultimate aim section has 13 bullets, um, but in this last section called the finally consider section, we really felt that this first bullet was critical to emphasize today. The concept that during remote learning, all means all. So programs are asked to do whatever they can to ensure that each and every child is able to participate in meaningful at-home learning. And this means taking into consideration multiple factors, including home language, which Tammy will talk about more in a bit, um, considering diverse learning needs, um, and there's a section on meeting the needs of diverse learners and children with special needs um, on pages 30 to 33. And in addition, over the last several days, there's been new guidance in, a, in the form of an FAQ that was released about supporting children with special needs. So you might want to um, uh, check out the ISBE website for the, that most recent document update FAQ. So consideration must be given when we're thinking about all means all. We really have to be thinking about things like home living situations. Um, not every family is um, managing the same level of stress in their home. And so remote learning could look very different in a family who might be caring for um, an ill family member with, with the virus, or they might be just concerned about um, making sure their family has enough food to eat. Um, on, on a less stressful level, um, one of the things to consider is that there might be multiple learners within a family and only one device. And so we need to consider um, that there, uh, there might be lots of different learners going on in the household and how are we making sure that, that everybody doesn't need to be on a computer in order to be learning. So it's quite possible that the students and families, the other thing to consider, oh, excuse me, missed something. Um, um, uh, we're finding, at least I'm finding in my work with lots of districts and programs is that even though there's an understanding that technology may be a barrier, um, I'm still seeing lots of programs who are using a technology-based e-learning model as their primary strategy for ensuring that children have opportunities for learning. And so we really need to support one another in sharing ideas and thinking outside of that box. Um, it's quite possible that the students and families who aren't showing up in the Zoom room, who aren't showing up on the Facebook pages, who aren't responding to the emails, those may be the families who are in the greatest need of support. And while some of us may not see our role as supporting families, but rather supporting children, we know that we can't support the children if the family's needs are not also being supported. So while this may be um, barriers that are too great for us to overcome, you know, such as family stress and meeting those basic needs, um, the best thing we can do is try. You know, as long as we've done our due diligence and we've reached out to families, maybe with phone calls, maybe with um, just regular old snail mail, um, at least we know we've tried and that's all that we can really um, ask of ourselves at the end of the day. So I'd like to share with you some examples of how other programs are meeting the needs of, of all children um, as they struggle with making sure that um, learning is happening for their preschoolers in their programs. So here's three different examples. On the far left, you see an example of activity packets that were um, 
uh, created and and um, and um, put together by volunteers and folks um, in the North Chicago School District. And these are distributed once per week, um, along with the uh, food distribution that's going on within that community. That has become a very common location for non-internet based um, activity distribution is around the, the food distribution sites. Um, so then um, in the center, you see an example of how, um, again, that Troy School District um, is meeting the needs of, of families who have children who were receiving occupational therapy support um, at school prior to the closure. So these are specialized activity suggestions that were provided both electronically and also through a um, activity packet model also being distributed at, at meal distribution sites. And then on the far right is a Spanish version of the choice board we saw earlier. This is providing um, materials for remote learning in Spanish, which again ensures all children will be able to uh, be meaningfully engaged. Keep in mind that even if the child has English, um, the folks at home may be primary Spanish speakers or may be speaking in a language other than Spanish, but it's not English. And so in order for them to be most effective in supporting their child's learning, they would need the instructions provided to them in a language that they are most familiar with. And we also want to keep in mind that at this time, the best learning can happen within a child and family's home language. It's not critical that everybody's uh, speaking English at this time. But Tammy will be talking more about that in a few moments. And so we'd also like to provide you with another opportunity here to share out some ideas that you have um, about how you've been able to ensure the edu educational needs of all children are being met um, in your program. And now I'm going to turn it back over to Tammy, who is going to comment and um, and share some more information with you. Excellent. Thanks, Sandy. And I just wanted to remind you, too, if you would please, we've got some great ideas that are scrolling through in the big chat box on your screen. But at this point, if you could use the chat that has appeared over your PowerPoint, that's the place where you want to type in your answer to that question about sharing one way that you're ensuring that the educational needs of all children are being met. So you'll see that again, it's covering up the PowerPoint slide on your screen. And if you would type your answer where it says type your answer here, that would be fantastic. That would allow us to catch those answers and be able to get those distributed to you uh, later on. Also, just so that you're aware, the chat box on the far left hand side um, could end up getting quite full, frankly, because we have 93 folks participating in today's webinar. So again, we just don't want to lose track of your answers to this particular question on that left side. Instead, we'd like to capture them in the text box that's covering up the PowerPoint right now. So excellent. We've got a lot of great ideas here, talking about the private Facebook pages, the mailing or emailing of packets, text messaging apps, phone calls, video visits, um, calling parents on the phone, speaking personally with students goes a very, very long way. Um, live video visits, YouTube videos, rotating staff at the food sites to be able to make uh, new and different connections with families, weekly phone calls, uh, using s'mores. Oh, sorry, I jumped and I lost that particular one. Uh, distributing uh, material written and digital in both English and Spanish via various formats calling on the expertise of our community, parent community liaison folks. Excellent. All right, so we've got some fantastic uh, opportunities or um, ideas that we've got that you're sharing. So these hopefully will be helpful to others on the call today too. Excellent, all right. I wanted to share this uh, section with you as well. This comes from the early childhood section of the ISBE guidance document, and it actually comes from page 35, as you can see there. And, <coughs> oh, goodness, pardon me. Um, 
There we go. And this has a couple of different ideas on it, but one uh, that we wanted to make sure we ha hit on was this first bullet where it talks about creating a consistent but responsive daily routine and sharing it with children. Because we know, of course, that children learn best and are most adaptable to change when they know what to expect and have consistency in their daily life. So this could be a key area that you can be supporting families right now, um, especially if they're struggling with or have yet to establish a consistent, albeit maybe flexible, but a relatively consistent daily routine. That might be an area that you can help support them. Also, it goes on to talk about as well, thank you, Sandy, for bringing it up, but also this issue of uh, what language should families be using at home. And we know, we know that each family member should interact with their children in their strongest languages. And by that, I mean the strongest language of the caregivers even if that means that the language is not English, and even if that means that their children may be hearing multiple languages each day, that's not a problem. In fact, that's a benefit. We know, quite frankly, that children will attain higher levels of play and engage in play longer if they're allowed to do so in their strongest languages. So there's no reason for things to have, have to be occurring in English right now in the homes. This actually could be one really, really beautiful silver lining that comes out of this whole situation is that children will have deeper um, understanding and a deeper knowledge of their other languages and that will we know from research that will help them when the time comes to attain high levels of English. Uh, this also goes on to talk about social emotional learning and also spending time uh, talking with children about their feelings. There's the social emotional piece. And then lastly spending time with children each day playing games, invented or purchased, telling stories, possibly reading books in any language that they have available to them. If they don't have books or they've run through all their books at this point, uh, please don't underestimate the power of telling stories and encouraging families to tell stories in all of their languages. And that's something that they can do too <clears throat> when they're conversing with other family members, whether it be by phone or video chat or whatever the case may be. I'm going to hand this back over to Sandy. She's going to share a few more thoughts with you. So as we're talking about families um, shifting to this role of being their child's teacher, this is probably the area that has come up most frequently as the greatest concern. Um, I was with a group of parent educators not too long ago um, family support folks who were saying that some families are so stressed out right now that they are really um, finding it nearly impossible to ensure that their children are learning. And so we really need to be aware of, of that challenge um, as we start to provide all of these wonderful ideas and materials for families. How do we balance the message to families about meeting their own needs as well as their children's needs and knowing that young children, the preschool age children that we're talking about, are going to learn best when they're playing, when they're engaging with others and just talking and reading. And so those are really the critical things to keep in mind. But what we want to share here with you now also in terms of supporting parents as they support children or supporting any family members as they support children is the Illinois Early Learning Project. If you're not familiar with this website, I really recommend that you go ahead and at some point take a few minutes and start clicking around in it. It is one of the go-to places for all things early childhood in the state of Illinois. But what we're going to talk about right now is these pages that have been dedicated to home learning. And so what you see on our slide here is the page that's titled, Keep Young Children Learning at Home During Trying Times. There's lots of information for families about the importance of just the simplicity of routines in your child's life and implementing positive approaches to guidance and appropriate expectations. Um, the website provides families with ways to give explanations to their young children regarding the health crisis and also how to choose developmentally appropriate activities to keep their child learning at home. 
The page also offers guidance to families about reaching out for the support that they may need, which is so critical. You'll also see um, kind of in the middle of this uh, web page is a link to another page with a similar title, but it's got very different information. And that page is called Learning at Home During Trying Times. And when you click and you go to that page, what you find are lots and lots of links for families to the many tip sheets that many of us are familiar with on the Early Learning Project website. The tip sheets um, are uh, something the Early Learning Project is known for. These are one-page descriptions about topics like discipline and stress and, and what's appropriate for screen time for children at home. I think it's really important that we keep in mind as we continue to um, provide activities for families that require the use of a screen, that we remember that the recommendations of screen time for preschool aged children is 15 minutes a day. Um, and I'm hoping I quote that correctly. Uh, it may be even less than that, it may be 10. <laughs> um, but there is a reference to that um, within the recommendations as well. So um, I encourage you to uh, go ahead and explore the Early Learning Project and, and know that many of the resources found on the Early Learning Project's pages are available in languages other than English. So that's really uh, helpful too. So now we know that uh, most of our family members are not trained teachers, but from birth, they really are their child's first teacher. So we'd like to give you an opportunity to now share some ways that you are supporting families to energize and reassure them as they engage in this new at-home learning. What are some ways that you've been able to reassure and energize families. I even see in our other chat box um, reaching out via postcards. Uh, according to Eckers, 15 minutes per screen time. Thanks, Karen. <laughs> Many of us are beholden to Eckers, and that is the guidance provided through Eckers. Um, that's, that's good for us to see and know. I appreciate that. Um, one of the things as you're all typing that I would love to share with you because this was this was critical to the group last week and we'll see how people uh, respond to it today. But one of my programs um, where it's a very small program and there are no family support folks available um, for the program, their PFA, but not expansion. They, um, the teachers decided that they wanted to provide families with, um, with something like the model of the parent cafe where parents could come together in a chat room and and talk to one another and not be presented to or not be in a quote training, but really an opportunity just for parents to talk to one another. And this was a really well received opportunity for these families. The teacher really found that parents were um, really responsive to one another both supporting one another's efforts at um, keeping things uh, working well at home, um, as well as offering ideas and suggestions of things that they'd been doing in their own families. And so this idea, um, and that just got started by sending text messages to families, asking them if they would be interested in coming together in a Google Hangout. Um, situation and there was these were very well received obviously this teacher has very good relationships with these families and they were very much in, um, excited to engage in this opportunity together so I see lots of different things are coming in uh, conscious discipline strategies yes I I know that we've all been hearing um, the the potential for an increase when stress goes up in families, the incidence of, of abuse of children also increases. And we really, that makes us all very nervous, I know. And so in any way that we could be reaching out to families to support them in their role at home, 
as teachers, as, as full-time caregivers, um, you know, as disciplinarians and guidance providers, um, really supporting that is so important. Uh, families send pictures. I have another teacher who she and her paraprofessional um, sent each child a personal photograph of the two of them. So one teacher is holding a sign that says, hi, so-and-so's name, and the other, and the para is holding a sign that says, we really miss your, you know, we really miss your great structures you build, or we really miss how much fun you have playing in dramatic play. And they sent these out to each child um, through the mail, and that actually got the most replies of anything else um, that they've done from families um, saying how wonderful those photographs were and how their children have hung them on the refrigerator and you know are carrying them all over the house and um, it's really been a great way to reach out and connect so so thank you very much for all of your great suggestions again you will be getting um, a printout of all of them to share with one another I also see some great ideas coming up in the chat box including um, birthday cards etc um, please I just want to call everybody's attention to if you can see the little um, triangle at the top of the chat box with the uh, exclamation mark. That means that we are quickly approaching the maximum amount of characters that our chat box can manage. So if you want to um, try to keep that in mind as you're sharing ideas with us, um, that would be great because we don't want to run out of space. Thank you so much, everybody. All right, so now I would like to share with you about the essential instructional recommendations that you'll find on page two again. We're back into the, um, the executive summary here where um, we're going to share with you the idea of um, it's not just how we provide the remote learning, but it's what we're providing. The recommendations really want to remind us that it's not um, that fa um, I'm sorry, pardon me. Um, the activities being provided to families support in support of educational continuity, continue to be aligned with your program's learning standards. Um, so if your program is using the Teaching Strategies Gold Assessment System or the Early Learning Standards, um, whatever system that you use for your curriculum and assessment, that we want to keep those in mind as we're planning for the activities and the experiences that we're suggesting for remote learning. And while we want teachers to maintain some autonomy in planning for remote learning, we also want them to keep in mind that the objectives for what children should know and be able to do at the end of preschool continue to drive their instructional choices. The recommendations provide guidance about this in the form of a chart that spans several pages. And this is what the um, beginning of the chart looks like. Um, and it's aligned, uh, the suggestions here are aligned with the Illinois Early Learning and Development Standards. What you see, this comes on page 37 of the recommendations document. Um, and since Early Child in Illinois encompasses birth to second grade, you notice that the chart is a resource for that full spectrum. And I do want to mention that earlier on, I did see that we actually have a second grade teacher um, as a participant today. So this may be particularly relevant for, for that individual um, where there's lots of support and recommendations for first and second grade students as well. And I want to uh, point out that in the introduction that precedes this chart, um, I'm going to read uh, for, uh, specifically from that introduction. It says, we are seeking to strengthen the already existing partnership between teachers and families and assisting families as they embrace their role as their children's first teacher in a new and evolving way. The goal is that over time, the family interactions will touch on each learning domain of a child's development. Still, the emphasis is on play-based family learning experiences, not the mastery of a finite list of skills. So in that center um, part of the chart, um, you will see 
lots of recommendations for ideas of things to do at home with children in each of the different domains. So on the next slide, we're go I'm going to share um, another resource for linking families to the standards. So this is a really uh, useful tool that you can also find on the Illinois Early Learning Project website. It's called Standard Start at Home. Um, this document is available in English and Spanish, and it includes um, all of the standards in the early learning and development standards uh, with descriptions of each learning area and suggested activities. And I'd like to dive a little deeper into it with you to show you a little bit more about what's provided here. And again, as you can see up in that upper right hand uh, corner is the circle with the link to where you would find this uh, link in that handout that we provided um, that that was um, where all of the links for today's presentation can be found. So again, this resource is called Standard Start at Home, and this is an example from the mathematics learning area. So the first two paragraphs are written in pretty family-friendly language, and they describe the components of math learning in early childhood. So just so families understand what math looks like in early childhood. And then it goes on with a further description of this particular math goal, which is about number concepts. And then it's followed by some tips for helping young children learn about numbers. And it then goes on to explain that shapes and um, and the concepts of spatial uh, spatial concepts um, of math learning for young children. So it, it gives good descriptions about each component of the standard. Each domain learning area and component of learning is described in this way. And then it goes on following the definitions and descriptions and tips are specific activities that can be done at home to foster learning of that concept or skill. And so this particular example provides several different kinds of counting activities. Counting that we know is important, like rote counting um, up to uh, 10, that uh, the one-to-one -one correspondence, and helping children understand things like the concept of more and less. And so this is an excellent resource um, for families available in English and Spanish. And now I'm going to turn it over to Tammy, who's going to talk a little bit more about dual language. Excellent. Thanks, Sandy. Let me click the next slide for you here. So as Sandy was saying, in this Standards at Home document, it is available in English and Spanish, and it goes through all the various early learning areas that are part of the IELDS standards here in Illinois. Therefore, one of the areas that it covers is the English language learner home language development learning area. And in this section of the Standards at Home document, it outlines the advantages of being bilingual, as you can see on the screen here. And then it goes on on the next page. I should mention here two words as advantages of being bilingual. There are some bullets. It talks about the importance of bilingualism, um, but it also then goes on to share and uh, some of the research in this particular area. On the next page, I don't have it on this slide, but on the next page in the document, it goes on to give uh, several tips about raising children bilingually. However, there are no activities, at least no activities that would be particularly useful to us at this moment in time because this standard start at home document was written a couple of years ago. So we wanted to make sure we provided you with some standard, um, some activities, I'm sorry, that are useful for this moment in time where we are right now with remote learning. So this is a brand new resource that has been released by the WIDA uh, Consortium, the Early Years Department at WIDA. And as you'll see, the handout document uh, that you were given in your confirmation email will have links to both of these documents. That's uh, links 4A and 4B, which are the English and Spanish version of this document. And what these are are activities and um, kind of ideas to get families talking about language. Um, and they can again be done in any language, um, but we only have them distributed in English and Spanish. So if you are distributing these to families in English, please do so with a reminder that that even though the document itself is in English, the family should be using whichever languages they feel most comfortable in to do the activities that are listed in these documents. 
doesn't matter if it's Arabic, Chichimeca, um, Telugu, you know, Urdu, whatever the language is, Arabic doesn't matter. They should be using their strongest languages at home with their kids, even though this particular document is only available in English and Spanish. <clears throat> Yes, indeed, Francis. Yes, language is very powerful. And so we want to make sure that families are engaging and, and pre creating as much of a language rich environment as they possibly can in their homes. And usually that's going to be happening in a language other than English when we're talking about our dual language learners or multilingual learners. All right. So let me sh uh, I'd like you now to get a chance to share a little bit about something that you are planning to do as a result of today's webinar. Maybe it's a new idea that you got from another participant. Maybe it's some of these resources, but, but let us know. And if you would, please do so in the middle part of your screen. So in that box that just showed up that's covering up the PowerPoint slide, that's the place you want to be typing right now where it says type your, type your answer here. Again, this is so we can capture your answers and don't lose them in that big chat box <laughs> that's also on the screen. All right, so it looks like mailing pictures, nature packet for parents to do outside, postcards, filming videos, new resources, um, a choice board, excellent. Uh, let's see, sharing resources with your team. Definitely no need to reinvent the wheel here. Less is more, right? We can share ideas with our, our coworkers. Um, with our co-teachers and, and all benefit um, from what we've been able to develop. That's that's a great idea. Um, some of the WIDA, WIDA resources, if that's applicable for your families. And of course, please feel free to share those WIDA resources with any of your families. They don't necessarily have to be identified as English learners to share those with them. Standards at home document looks like that might be of some use. Great. So we've got some good ideas coming in. The tip sheets, excellent. So glad that you find those useful. I think that's one of the best resources that we have at this point in time. In fact, I was just sharing the um, Illinois Early Learning Project's website and tip sheets with some folks from some other states just yesterday um, that were wondering how here in Illinois we're support, supporting our preschool multilingual learners. And I let them know about that website. Um, so hopefully they can do it in their states too. Awesome. All right. Thank you for sharing your thoughts on this. All right. Very good. Now, there is one more recurring theme that we haven't shared with you that is peppered throughout the entire ISBE do guidance document, and that is of taking care of yourself. You can see all of these bullets on this particular slide where they reference taking care of yourself. We want you to know that these recommendations we've shared with you today were written to throw you a life preserver. That is to support you, the educators, not to make your work of teaching children any more unmanageable or any more difficult than it may already be at this point. Please, please remember to add taking care of yourself to your to-do list if you haven't done so already. We know that if we don't care for ourselves, we will be unable to care for others. So with that in mind, I'm going to give you just a moment to, to, to say thank you to you. But also, if there's any last burning questions that you might have, if you would like to ask those in the big chat box over on the left side of your screen, um, if they are specific to your particular program, it may be that you need to address those questions to COVID-19. It is people. Let's see. Let's see what kind of questions you've got at this point. But as a reminder, we've got the COVID-19 email address up on the screen for you, too, just in case you need that. Yes, Mary, thank you. Meet yourself. Whoa, ooh, it's scrolling too fast. Meet yourself where you are, just as you meet your families where they are. Absolutely. Much better than I could have said it myself. So we still have a couple of moments left, so please feel free to add your burning questions or any questions. Really, they don't even have to be burning. They could be, you know, lukewarm if you'd like. <laughs> we'll put those over in that chat box on the left side so we can add your thoughts. Uh, do you know what we do? Whoop. What do we do with our file TSG checkpoint? I don't. Um, I will, Sandy, if you want to chime in, if you know, either in the text box or if you want to turn your mic back on and answer, I, I frankly don't know the answer to that particular question. That may be a COVID-19, it is B question. Um, same thing for mailing shipping costs uh, with regards to grant money and using that. That would be a question towards COVID or to, to address towards the COVID-19, it is B email address that you've got on the screen. Um, Excellent, Melanie. I'm glad this helped you feel better about what you are already doing. 
<laughs> Thanks, Gene. I'm glad you like the life preserver image. It took me a little while to find that one, too. I liked it, too. So cool. Thanks for joining us, too, Gene. I appreciate it. Um, where can you access the book, Maureen? Uh, so it's the ISBE guidance document. When you get the handout for today's session, that was part of your confirmation email. So that same email that had the link in it that got you onto the screen today and onto our webinar, that very same email has uh, the words handout in bold and in all caps. Click on that, you'll be able to get to the handout for today, and it's going to be the links 1A through 1D on that handout, and you'll be able to access it in whatever language you would like. There's four different languages for the document there. Uh, let's see, we got a PFA teacher question. We're required to continue. Are we required to continue individualized instruction requirements? I would direct you towards the FAQ document that is we just recently put out and our office just retweeted recently. Um, that may be able to answer your question. If it doesn't, then I would say email it to the COVID-19 at isbe.net. May I chime in for a moment, Tammy? I see a question about yes. uh, using money for materials if you are a PFA or PFA expansion program you can absolutely be using your budget to purchase materials for children at home those materials would not be expected to be returned to the program when school resumes I hope that answers your question And Sharifa, first, I apologize if I'm not saying your name correctly, Ms. Townsend. Um, you're asking about suggestions shared with families regarding challenging behavior that's a result of these changes in the child and family's life. You know, my first go-to for that would be the Illinois Early Learning Project. Um, some of the links we sent that are part of the handout that take you to Illinois Early Learning Project, one of them is a resource list uh, specifically pulling together all their tip sheets. And one of, uh, at least a few of them, I believe, deal specifically with that with regards to challenging behaviors that might be arising, if I remember correctly. And some of them, I believe, are even translated. So I'd start there. Sandy, please let me know if there's anything else I'm not thinking of. Um, pyramid resources, too. So sorry, Tammy. I just wanted to also uh, recommend the challengingbehavior.org website, which is part of the um, pyramid model. There are some new um, links to social stories to support families um, during this time um, and other information for families about challenging behavior. Um, if you go to the family engagement um, uh, portion of the website. There's lots of information there. Awesome. Jill, thank you for putting the link in there. Um, I can't talk and type at the same time, at least not reliably. So thank you for throwing that in there. I appreciate it. And uh, Kathy, thank you too. Uh, Kathy mentioned, Kathy Villano, that ISBE is encouraging programs to amend their budgets to access monies that may not be used as planned, like maybe you originally were planning a field trip or a parent night or something to purchase materials. So she's saying to email or call your ISBE consultant to find out how that could be done. I also want to respond. There's been two questions about the final checkpoint. Um, it is my understanding at this time that we should not be overly concerned with uh, the checkpoints. Um, there is an understanding and a recognition that it would be really impossible to accurately, through our observation-based assessment methods, to be able to accurately assign checkpoints of children who we aren't even seeing. So um, if you're concerned for a monitoring from a monitoring standpoint um, that you won't be able to demonstrate um, progress and and growth, um, those those there will be an understanding that at, during this unprecedented time that it would not have been feasible to have collected documentation. Um, I hope that helps with that question. We just have one minute left and it looks like questions have slowed down. So thank you, Sandy.